combustion was power beyond our understanding. Power out of control, with all the elements unleashed in raging fury, piling up mountains, carving out valleys, building the earth we know today. A large part of the earth's upheaval was caused by combustion, the name we give to the explosion which occurs when air and fuel are combined with heat or heat. How the explosive force of combustion is controlled to give us these individual characters. Air, for example, can be pictured as this big, happy-looking fellow floating peacefully in space. But don't be fooled by his vaporous appearance, for this character is plenty solid. And those enormous muscles are as strong as oxygen. But air is usually lazy and languid, an easygoing sort of character. In fact, air gets along fine with anybody, even with this explosive little rascal, fuel. When fuel comes from petroleum, he's really a tough little character, bursting with energy and hydrocarbons. Together, air and fuel have tremendous possibilities, but they never get anywhere without the energy of heat or ignition. This little fellow can be any sort of high temperature, like the heat from friction. Or heat generated by compression. Or he can be an electric spark. If ignition gets too close to air and fuel, anything might happen. In fact, the three characters together can be six times. That's right, boys, you'd better scratch. Because when ignition catches fuel and air under the right conditions, there's always a terrific explosion. And boy, are they burned up. Burning, of course, is the same thing as combustion. When it happens inside a closed space, it is called internal combustion. As we have seen, combustion occurs in nature on a gigantic scale. Here, far down in the earth, explosive gases have accumulated. When gas burns, it expands. That is, it pushes out furiously for more room, and that push is power. But this is wasted power, power out of control. How could it be made to do useful work? Well, if some imaginary giant wanted to control this natural power, he would have to cap the volcano with a huge sliding plug or piston to capture the full force of the explosions. Then he would hitch up a rod to connect the sliding piston to a wheel, thus converting up and down motion into more useful rotary motion. Of course, it's not practical to harness a volcano, but if we cut our illustration down to size and then turn it upside down, we can use it to show how an internal combustion engine works by this same principle, utilizing the explosion of air and fuel in a confined space to drive a piston. Now, by using more practical materials, we have one unit of an engine, a cylinder to confine the force of combustion, a piston to capture these forces, a connecting rod to transmit them, and a crankshaft to convert the motion from up and down to rotary motion. But these mechanical parts are useless without our three elements of power, air, fuel, and ignition. If we can get these rascals inside of our cylinder, we can convert this dead pile of metal into useful life. To do this, we first move the piston down to create a vacuum. This draws air and fuel down through this opening in the top. Now they're trapped in the cylinder, and there's no way out. Next, we move the piston up to squeeze them into a smaller and smaller space. 
because we know that the tighter they're squeezed, the more furiously they will react. Then, just as the piston approaches the top of the cylinder, we get ready for ignition. Here he comes. This is power under control. In a simple arrangement of a cylinder, a piston, a connecting rod, and a crankshaft. Of course, we get the power of air, fuel, and ignition in different ways in different engines. For example, in the gasoline engine, air and fuel first come together in a carburetor, a sort of meeting room where the boys are mixed together into an explosive gas before being drawn into the cylinder. Notice the carburetor is a much larger opening for air than for fuel because our engine needs 15 times more air than fuel. By weight, that is. By volume, we use 9,000 cubic feet of air every time we use up one cubic foot of gasoline. So you see, air is a very important part of combustion. But remember, to get power from air and fuel, we also need ignition. We keep this little rascal stored up in a battery until we're ready to use him. Hey, wait a minute, not yet. Before we show you how we control ignition, we must first show how we control the intake of air and fuel. When this little door, called the intake valve, opens, and the piston moves down, the mixture of air and fuel in the carburetor is sucked down into the cylinder, mixture to much less than its original volume. Now, when we're ready to ignite these compressed gases, we will bring ignition into the cylinder through this spark plug. Notice how the end of the plug provides a space between two points which extend into the combustion chamber. When ignition gets here, he'll have to jump across this space. And that takes the force of many thousands of volts. But ignition, as he comes out of the battery, is not strong enough for this job. So we have to step up his voltage to give him more force. One part of the method is to run him through this coil. When he comes out here, he's really full of pep and energy. Now we're ready. Okay, ignition, go to it. As soon as air and fuel give us their power, Another door, called the exhaust valve, opens to let the piston clear the cylinder of burnt gases. So we see that four strokes of the piston are necessary to complete one power cycle. Down, up, down, and up. Hence the term four cycle engine, which simply means four strokes to one cycle. One, the piston draws air and fuel into the cylinder. That's intake. Two, it squeezes them into a small space. That's compression. Three, ignition touches them off for the power stroke. And four, the piston forces out the burnt residue through the exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Of course, some engines operate with just two strokes to make one power cycle. In between these strokes, we take care of intake and exhaust. But whether we have a two-cycle or a four-cycle engine, we must keep the crankshaft turning smoothly between each power stroke. So we use the momentum of this heavy flywheel. But to get continuous power, we must fill in those intervals with other power strokes. And so we take our final step. To get the smooth power flow of the modern engine, we simply put several of these one-cylinder engines together and connect the several pistons to a common crankshaft. With this arrangement, 
power strokes now occur in different cylinders in regular sequence. Thus, there's a continuous delivery of power strokes to the crankshaft. This is power in harness, power under control in an internal combustion engine. Whether we use an L head or a valve and head engine, this is the power that changed the good old days into a better new day. This is power to multiply our efforts and expand our accomplishments. And the uses for this power are as different as the needs of man. But whatever the type of engine, whether gasoline or diesel, on land, on sea, or in the air, they all capture the power of air, fuel, and ignition. Wild, untamed, and destructive in the beginning, but now brought under perfect control to give us the tremendous useful power of the internal combustion engine. <laughs> 